This weekend, Major League Table Tennis will host its first ever Washington competition, and this isn't your leisurely basement ping pong we're talking about. Yeah, these are professional athletes from 20 different countries, with many players who are Olympic champs or hopefuls for this summer's games. Today in Beyond the Buzzer, Kelly Koopman's got in on the action. All right, I'm here with Major League Table Tennis, and I've got my friend Luba over here, who's going to show me how it's really done. But you know what, first of all, I'm wearing heels right now, and that's just not gonna cut it. So you know what? We're getting real today. Okay, Kick off the heels, good. Luba. Okay, you start. Okay, you can I'll start. start. You know, while we're playing, as we attempt to do this all at one time, why don't you just talk to me, Major League Table Tennis. I mean, Table Tennis has been in the Olympics for a while. Why Major League Tennis now? Table tennis. So it's uh, one of the things that in North America we didn't have any major league. So it's very common in Europe. And this is the first professional league in North America and it attracts the players from all over the world. Ooh. You almost win. Almost, <laughs> almost, not quite. So what is it like to see it in person? Because that's a different kind of experience than watching it on TV. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a different um, experience. So come and watch the games because this is, these are world class players female and male players, which is also the first league that um, female players can play against male players. Some of okay. the players actually for the first time ever played against a female player. So it, it's a mixed, mixed um, gender. And um, what was the question exactly? <laughs> <laughs> how about this one? What yeah. type of athletic prowess does it take to do this? Because it's not like how you and I are playing right now. I mean, no, this no. is, this uh, takes some strength and precision. Well, yeah, so this is what we said yesterday. It's a difference between ping pong and table tennis. Sure. So ping pong is easy, recreational, you don't, um, you hit, uh, I see people hitting over the table and uh, without any rules. But okay. again, table tennis is an Olympic sport. Right. And the better you get, the more physical it gets. Okay. So. How about yeah. the Seattle Spinners? They're one of the, how many teams? Eight teams, you say? Yeah, there is eight teams, uh, four on the East uh, Division, four on the West Div Division. So we're the West Division. And um, with Seattle Spinners, there is Portland Paddlers, Bay Area Blasters, and Texas Smash. So we compete once a month for seven seven weekends and then right now we have two more weekends so it's very important because we're playing for the first two spots and we go to playoffs with the east division and you want to win that first title right of course <laughs> first title for major league table tennis yeah, i'm all very right. competitive so i want to win of course <laughs> aren't we all um yeah. how about i get a couple tips here before we see the professionals really yeah. go at it here um i'll take any kind of tips you can give me on yeah, how to so do this so the first thing when i saw you serving surf this way in a palm. So instead of dropping the yep. ball, you have to toss the ball. Okay. So hand-eye coordination, very important. Keep the, keep the racket close to the ball. Don't try to hit it this way because you will never hit it. Mm -hmm. But co keeping it close, but the toss has to be at least six inches, which is the width of the racket okay. or the width of the net. So okay. try it. Uh, holding the racket is very important as well. So between your index finger and your thumb, you place it exactly in the middle this way. Okay. And then the three other fingers will hold the, grab the racket. So make sure it's all the way to the handle. And then when you extend your arm, it looks like extension of your arm. It's very okay. nice. Now you bend your elbow, 90 degree. And then this is the position at the table. So mm -hmm. a little bit back there, because when you bend your knees and you lean forward, you should be just behind the table, not over the table. So kind of like that. So this is called the distance from the table, okay? So okay. now I'm gonna serve and then wait for the ball to come to you. Okay. Now we already play better. There. Whoa! <laughs> okay, nice. Now Cheers. this is what everyone really wants to see. They want to see the uh, Forrest Gump style table yes. tennis where you get the people yeah. going fast and hard yeah. at it. Let's let them take it away, everyone. You increase the speed, you inc uh, work on the spin because that's the way to control the ball. Ten, forty. What's up? Kelly, you wanna warm up? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm ready. So cool. All right, Crazy, shout out to right? our photographer James for getting all those angles too, yeah. and Kelly for doing that interview completely while playing. I'm impressed. It's it's impressive. I mean, look at Holly. Yeah. <laughs> I love so, so Tyra and I had a chance <laughs> to learn, you know, a trick or two uh, yeah. about table tennis, and we even played a quick game of doubles with Kelly and Holly. Um, Holly and myself <laughs> were uh, the apparent winners of said match, yeah, but. You won. 
it's, it's so hard. It's so fast. And like the hand eye coordination, you're it like, you're just hard. trying to keep up. It is not easy. No. And I, I was impressed with those athletes. And it's such a fast sport. Fast. Look at how quick. Good just job, back and forth Steve. and back and forth and back and yeah. forth. Yeah, and, and then you've got to switch forth. spots. Look at me, you chase after the ball. <laughs> <laughs> so we did get a, um, a, you call it a paddle? Yeah. Well, paddle yeah. from the team here. So they did demonstrate, the coach demonstrated with Kelly on how to hold it. Mm -hmm. It's like a It's kind of like v. a V yeah. right here. Yep. Easy peasy. We've also got a ball. So I'm going to serve it okay. right now okay. off of our Arc Seattle table. It's going to go, should I go that way or this way? Go side, like try to go towards our. I'll go sideways. The side. I don't want to break anything. Yeah, we don't want to break a camera because that would not this. be good. All right, count me, count me down. Count All me right, down. Three, two, one. She didn't break anything. <laughs> Good job, friends. I was a little nervous there. <laughs> we should mention that table tennis competition is this weekend. You can check it out at Angel of the Winds Arena in Everett. Should be an awesome time, I think. Very cool. I think I, it's so cool. I'm just so silly. Too silly to take this seriously. <laughs> I, there's a lot of potential, my friends. There's potential for no you. No clowning you around. That's there's how I potential. Look. No. <laughs> You did a good job, Tyra. I'm proud of you. <laughs> February is American Heart Month, a time when all people are encouraged to focus on their cardiovascular health. Yeah, it's important, and it's essential to shed light on the strides being made right here in the Puget Sound region to address racial disparities in heart disease outcomes. Joining us this morning is cardiologist Dr. Heidi Nicewarner with Virginia Mason Franciscan Health. Uh, good morning to you. Good morning. Nice to have you with us today. So talk about these racial disparities. Why is heart disease more common in some races rather than others? Sure. Um, we know from research that there is actually systemic bias in the healthcare system itself. Um, that leads to um, access issues um, in local care. There's missed opportunities for prevention and even dismissal of symptoms, um, particularly amongst um, Black and Hispanic patients who even have insurance, uh, adequate insurance coverage and desire for treatment. Um, we know that Patients in BIPOC communities also face an increased risk of these cardiovascular, negative cardiovascular outcomes. Um, we find that they have increased rates of myocardial infarction, uh, heart attacks, congestive heart failure, and stroke um, compared to white counterparts. Dr. Virginia Mason is ranked among the top 50 in heart and vascular care in the nation. What steps is the hospital system taking to tackle those disparities you just spoke of? So um, amongst the cardiovascular uh, division, we're actually doing three evidence-based strategies to help with combating bias. The first one is to bring care closer to home for all of our patients. We have um, worked hard to increase access to high-quality specialty care with uh, eight different clinics throughout the Puget Sound region. We also work hard with our patients to develop personalized care plans for patients, um, understanding that a single plan Plan, a single treatment plan won't work for everyone. And then we also um, have a really diverse uh, group of cardiovascular specialists who represent um, our local communities, um, those where we serve. Like a lot of people, um, you know, heart disease runs in my family. So I'm, I'm taking notes on this, on this next question here. You know, what advice do you have for people who want to improve their heart health? Sure. So um, knowing your family history is really a, a first excellent step. Talk to your parents, your grandparents, your siblings about potential risks that you should have checked out. Um, and then making sure you're getting regular checkups with your doctors. So understanding your risks for things like hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, checking in on your weight. Those are all things that I would recommend to everyone. Any, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say any foods or drinks that we can maybe do a better job at consuming. Sure. So minimizing processed foods and um, uh, fried foods, um, those are often kind of a low-hanging fruit to minimize. Um, we know that following a more Mediterranean-style diet or even a plant-based diet is healthier in terms of cardiac outcomes. And it's important to remember that it's never too late to start or, or, or change your patterns to improve your heart health, correct? Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, doctor, for joining us. That was really helpful. Happy to have been here.
Nice to have you with us. Yeah, it's, I mean, you got to think about it, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, I shared that, you know, heart disease runs in my family. I uh, lost a, a grandmother because of some heart oh. conditions, you know, more than 10 years ago. Um, and so it's something you got to think about, especially if it's something that runs in your family, is you got to take care of that ticker and mm -hmm. do what you can to maybe not eat those processed foods. Remember to exercise um, and, and really find that balance and make those important changes in your life. Put that first step, knowing your family's history, yeah. and then, yeah, taking action on your own, too. The homelessness issue isn't unique to one city. Many cities in western Washington are trying to find the right solution to a growing problem. And that includes the city of Kirkland. And joining us this morning to talk about this and so much more is Kelly Koopmans and Mayor Kelly Curtis. Well, guys, unfortunately, it sounds like I think I've lost my IFB connection with you, but hopefully you're able to hear me, and I'd like to continue my conversation here with Kirkland Mayor uh, Kelly Curtis. Thanks so much for making some time with us Thank today. You. I'm delighted to be here. Thank so. you. Well, in the intro, Tyra and Steve were talking about homelessness, how it's not a problem just isolated to the Seattle area, but King County at large, which, of course, Kirkland is part of. What is the current homelessness situation in Kirkland and talk to me a little bit about the work the heart team and how they come into play. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Homeless does impact everyone throughout King County and it is an issue on the east side. Kirkland is working really hard to provide compassionate, supportive care for our unhoused community members. We have created a homeless response team. It's called HEART. It's Homeless Assistance Response Team. It consists of 11 community members from our police department, our parks department, our public works department, our human services department, and our crisis responders who are trained mental health professionals to reach out to our unhoused uh, community members and provide them services and support. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to compassionately move people into safe housing. Sometimes that takes time, sometimes that takes many conversations, but we work really hard to help people get the services they need so they can thrive and our community is strengthened. You guys also have this new program that caught my attention to uh, attract and retain employees to work yes. for the city. And this comes yeah. this comes to child care costs, whereas the a couple of years ago, I think the average was like $14,000 a year um, across the state, which is more expensive than it was at the time for tuition of UW. Yeah. So tell me about this program, where it came from, because this is something that was just announced. Yes, we started this in January. The council really is looking at how to retain, hire and retain our best employees. Child care is a barrier. Finding affordable, reliable child care where you know that your child is safe and you can focus on your job is difficult to find. And you and I know it impacts women significantly. We saw that during COVID. So we are creating a child care initiative and our employees are able to place in child care their, their children from two to six years old. Mm -hmm. We're doing it in partnership with the Lake Washington Institute of Technology, which has an earning learning program. And um, we really expect this to be successful for for our, our employees. We're also looking at, we're really interested in breaking down barriers for civic engagement. Mm -hmm. And we have a number of volunteer positions within the city on our boards and commissions. We would love to be able to pro provide child care for that so people with young families can participate in civic life. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at, um, we have a lot of workers, our police our first responders, our public works, work swing shift. They don't work nine to five. So how can we provide child care options for those parents mm -hmm. also? That's a conundrum I find myself in, working yes. this 3 a.m. Yeah. until exactly. noon shift. You talk about civic engagement. You mm -hmm. guys have this workshop that I believe started on Tuesday uh, that you're trying to get small businesses involved mm -hmm. in. Uh, and there's also an opportunity for them to get some money out of this too. How does it all work? It started this week. It's called the business or competition pitch no, business pitch competition. Yes. And um, it is 35 businesses have applied. These range from realtors to bookstores to any kind of small business. Mm -hmm. And what we saw last year is we received over 1,300 new business licenses. And frequently these are uh, women-owned businesses, Im Im newly immigrant populations that don't know how to navigate, um, how to get a loan, how to write a business plan, how to do marketing. So we're taking them through a five-week program mm -hmm. to help 
help them support, you know, get their business started, and then they get to participate in April in a pitch competition. And if they win, they get a $5,000 grant to start their business. Mm -hmm. And having just started on Tuesday, what we're really seeing is not only are they valuing what they're learning, but they're really valuing the connections they're making with each mm -hmm. other. Because we all need a support system when we're trying something new. What's the next focus for you going into 2024? Um, we're, we've got many, we're really looking at how to break down barriers. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to us to how to get people engaged in civic life and um, understand how their local government works. Frequently people don't know, how do you talk to city council or what does a public works department do? So last year we created the Kirkland Initiative and it was a, a 18 cohort, member cohort, and we worked really hard to reach out into uh, populations that usually don't engage mm -hmm. with their local government government. It was an eight-week program and we walked them through this is what your council does and this is what a police department does and again it was an opportunity for people to understand their local community, connect with each other and um, strengthen their connections to the community and what it what civic life is like. Mm -hmm. That has been hugely successful and we'll continue to do it next year. We're looking at doing it for a program for our young people mm -hmm. so because they're not getting the civic education and school and again what we've seen come out of that is um, people that have participated are now volunteering they're at, they're looking for appointments on our boards and commissions and who know they might run for city council someday who knows who we're talking to exactly. <laughs> several years down the road from now mayor curtis thank you so much for your time you're welcome thank you